good morning and welcome to the uh, CU Denver School Public Affairs First Friday Breakfast Series for November. Um, every November we uh, focus on the election and sometimes we have it before the election, sometimes after. Um, and there's a lot of uh, important things on our ballot this year, although uh, many of us are also looking ahead to next year. It's just a year away that there'll be another presidential race and uh, congressional seats and all the big things that happen in 2024. Um, is that an echo? Yeah. So we, can we fix that echo, Didi? Yes, we can. We can. <laughs> I think one of Oh, is it better? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we do have people online, by the way, and that's one reason we'll, we have the mics and I'm trying to make sure they can hear uh, well. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. Um, the, uh, I'm Paul Teske, the Dean of the School of Public Affairs, and I'm delighted that you're all here. I'm also delighted that our Chancellor, Michelle Marks, is is here uh, as well. She may need to leave a little early for another meeting, but uh, thank you for being here. Um, we have a great panel. We're going to talk mainly about Prop HH, uh, the uh, somewhat complicated thing on your ballot that uh, would uh, reduce the rise in the likely rise in property taxes and use Tabor uh, money and reduce those refunds, although it's much more complicated than that. Uh, but first, some logistics and thank yous. I uh, want to thank Dee Dee Flynn and our spa staff that does the logistics putting this together. Uh, they do a great job. I want to thank our caterer today, uh, Pirate uh, Chef, who is a local fa small family-owned business. Uh, one, we had the land acknowledgement up on the, on the slides that were going around and we're on the ancestral land of the Ute, Arapaho and Cheyenne uh, Native American tribes. We're also uh, on this campus, uh, was created in the, in the early 1970s as an urban renewal project that tore down a, a thriving uh, Hispanic neighborhood. And uh, you know, there's the 9th Street Museum and other things to try to commemorate that. Uh, but we wanna acknowledge those uh, things that came before CU Denver. Um, I just want to get a sense of the crowd. Uh, how many of you are CU alums? Okay. School of Public Affairs alums? Okay. Uh, CU faculty? Students? Staff? Okay. Um, and how many of you have voted already? Uh, we get to vote so early. Okay. So this may not be as much about persuasion because you've already voted, uh, but more about knowledge of, of what happens if this passes or fails or what the future is all about. Um, and so uh, that'll, be, that'll be very helpful. Um, I'll just, a uh, few other logistics. Uh, SPA, every MPA and MCJ student that graduates does a client capstone. Uh, and if you are a potential client, which is a government nonprofit or private sector agency that needs some free consulting essentially from a smart uh, graduate student, please let us know. And we're looking for opportunities and matches there. Um, we have other events coming up uh, that were probably on the slides as well. On November 20th, our chancellor is gonna interview uh, the FEMA director, Deanne Criswell, who is a SPA MPA alum uh, and the first female uh, FEMA uh, director. So we're looking forward to that. And um, then uh, our December period is not a first Friday breakfast, but a first Friday lunch. And we're excited to have Senator Michael Bennett coming to talk uh, about uh, AI and democracy, which is kind of becoming increasingly important issue. Uh, so please look for that and join us. Uh, logistics for today, um, we will get to your questions and there should be three by five cards. If you wanna write some down, we'll collect them and ask those at the end. Um, the food is there and, and please continue to uh, get that and get coffee. There's bathrooms around the corner. We'll, we'll finish at 10, but we're not sort of kicked out of here. And if if you're able to stay and chat and network, and I'm not sure if the panelists can stay a little bit, but that's always uh, a good experience. Um, and then I want to thank uh, our friends at Stiefel uh, for supporting this event. Um, Stiefel is a local uh, and national public finance firm, and um, they've been uh, very supportive of the school in many ways. And I want to uh, Thank Josh, uh, and let Stiefel come up and say a couple of words. Perfect. People tell me I don't need a microphone. Um, we are very fortunate to be here uh, as a public finance underwriting firm. This is a very important topic to us and to our uh, investors that we work with as well. 
Uh, most importantly, I think our role in Colorado and across the country really does is an offshoot as practitioners of public policy. So the opportunity to foster this type of dialogue, to benefit from it, to help educate our clients, uh, many of which are here in the room, and we appreciate you being here as well, uh, is just very important to how we do business. So um, thank you to the school. Uh, the school is also a client. Uh, uh, thank you to all the panelists and, and to everybody for your questions in advance. I think as a state, we're better for the dialogue. So thanks, everybody. Right. So I think um, in our advertisement or invitation, we talked about this as Colorado Decides 2023. There's other stuff on the ballot um, at the state level, Prop II around um, tobacco taxes and pre-K. Uh, there's in Denver, there's a big school board race. Uh, there's a Denver... Um, a ballot initiative to continue the, the pre-K program funding. There's school board races uh, around uh, the state. There's a mayoral race in, uh, in Aurora and I think in Pueblo and council races. Uh, we had Mayor Kaufman here talking about gun violence a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so there's a lot going on, although not as much as there will be a year from now. Um, but we're gonna focus uh, on, uh, on Prop HH. Um, which is uh, you know, one of the more complicated and interesting parts of our ballot. And um, first I wanna introduce this amazing panel that we've put together and uh, do so relatively briefly, just so we have lots of time. Um, to my immediate right is Senator Barb uh, Kirkmeyer. Uh, Barb is a fourth generation Coloradan. Uh, she has, holds a bachelor's in science and education from Boulder and uh, goes to our football games apparently and is excited about the way the team is doing. Um, she uh, was involved with a dairy farm and a small family business, uh, started uh, community service in Weld County, uh, was acting director for DOLA, the Department of Local Affairs under Governor Owens, uh, and is now a state elected state senator and ran for Congress uh, in the last round and uh, had a very close race in the new eighth district, I think 1200 votes out of 200,000, something in that range. Uh, and, um, and continues to do great work. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. One of, one of the things, and in a minute, I'm gonna ask people for a very brief comment about what inspired them to get into public service and public affairs and, or stay in it, because we know it's a difficult uh, time to be doing this kind of work. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Barb will have some good comments on that. So we appreciate you being here. Um, next to Barb is um, Jesse Paul. Jesse is an award-winning, uh, writer and editor for the Colorado Sun. He's covered state and local policy issues for quite a while. Uh, he has a degree from Colorado College. Uh, he's originally from Wilmington, Delaware, where I'm sure he, like everybody else, knows Joe Biden and uh, sees him regularly on the streets. Um, we're, we're delighted to have Jesse here. And, and I, I think it's probably obvious, but we kind of set this up as, as Barb on the uh, conservative side is, is going to be talking mostly in, in, uh, with concerns about Prop HH. Harry Kennedy is going to talk more about um, the, the positive view of it. And Jesse, I guess, is kind of in the middle and covering the politics. Or I'm sure he has a personal opinion, but uh, we'll be, we're delighted to have him on the panel. And then to the far right, Harry Kennedy um, uh, is a native Coloradan, went to Manual High School, uh, graduated from St. Lawrence University, an MPA from Columbia. Uh, and a JD from University of Denver. Um, she's been involved in the state budget in many ways for many years. Um, when I first came to Colorado, uh, I had the privilege of working with Donald Kay Foundation on school finance report, trying to understand that complicated topic. And when I went to Carrie, who was then at the children's campaign, about 2004, 2005, um, like she was like the first person I thought really actually understood um, the nuances because it is crazy complicated. And, and I, my jaw kept dropping as she explained to me how Tabor and the School Finance Act and mill levies all combined to uh, create fascinating and complicated public finance in Colorado. Uh, Carrie's also been elected as the state treasurer uh, and uh, was the CFO in Denver uh, and just has been involved with these issues for a very long time. So we have an excellent panel here. Um, as I said, a, a new thing we want to try is, a, and if you're okay with this, a very brief um, just a couple words about what inspired you to get into or stay in public service. And I, and I certainly consider the journalism that the Colorado Sun does uh, to be public service. So maybe, uh, Carrie, can you start with that? It's on. Ah, perfect. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, <clears throat> so I guess personally what inspired me to get into public service early in my career, which I'm, um, was a long time ago, uh, is always, my motivation's always been public education. I went to Manual High School, and I think at the time, I really appreciated uh, what it is to go to a school that doesn't have the resources, uh, that it needs to really support all the students who were there. Uh, only half my class graduated, and I watched firsthand um, the struggles that the faculty had. They were incredible, um, but they didn't, they weren't able to give students what they believe the students needed to be successful. And it's motivated me my whole career to try to improve our financial structure for public education. I watched the same challenges 30 years later when my kids went to public school here and um, you know, had faced budget cuts where programs that they really cared about were getting cut. And even basic things like not having air conditioning or having to eat their lunch on the floor of the hallway where thousands of shoes walked up and down every day because there just wasn't enough desks, there wasn't enough space, there wasn't enough resources. And um, spent a lot of time with their teachers hearing about the challenges they face. So I personally believe we can do a lot better. I aspire to have an education system in this state um, that is exceptional and to support our students all the way through higher education um, and give them the kind of opportunities that I was given growing up so that they can become the people they really want to become and have the support to get there. And that is what motivates me. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Jesse? My, my story is a little less uh, inspiring. <laughs> I, was, I, I was working at the Denver Post and was basically told, you're going to cover the legislature, you're going to be laid off. So I, I ended up covering the legislature. And um, after about one session, you know, I really did not want to cover politics, but uh, after one session at, into the Gold Dome, once you kind of start to understand the players and the, and the policies, now everything important comes through uh, the Capitol. I really enjoyed it. And um, that was 2017. So uh, six or seven sessions later, I'm still there. I really enjoy it, even though it can be really trying at times, um, just with the personalities and the pressure from the public and lawmakers. Um, it is, it's, a, it's a cool thing to be able to kind of... Um, sit between folks like, like um, Senator Kirkmeyer and, and Ms. Kennedy and say, okay, like you guys are each presenting your side of things. Here's, here's my understanding of the issue from the, the smarter, than, smarter than I am people that I talk to. So I, I really do enjoy it now, but, but my start was not, um, <laughs> I did, was not inspired to cover politics necessarily. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Barb? Thank you. So, um, you know, growing up, I never thought I would be involved in politics. Uh, you know, pretty much like everyone else, you know, mind your own business, go out and make a living, raise a family, owned a couple businesses, owned a dairy farm and a flower shop and um, got involved because at one point there were like 10 municipal regional solid waste disposal facilities that were looking to be sited within my neck of the woods in Southwest Weld County. I lived at that time, I had a dairy farm, so I and I still live out in that area in the unincorporated part of the county, so I don't live in town. But I found myself going to North Glen Planning Commission, North Glen Council, Thornton, uh, Erie, Decono, Hudson, and talking about all of these landfills that were proliferating in our area. And you know, so I got engaged, became a community activist and got engaged. Um, and when I approached my county about it, my county commissioner told me that you're just down there chasing windmills and you just need to stop. And cause I live 45 miles away from the County seat. And I thought, huh, I'm like, you're going to be really sorry when I catch one of those windmills. And that's when I decided to run for County commissioner because, you know, I'm, I'm there. I felt like I needed to go fight for my community, my neighborhood, um, have our voice heard. And that's what motivated me to run in the first place. And um, I won, I beat that guy by 400 votes. And it was like gut wrenching, just so you know. Um, I mean, it was like you know, we, we did. It was a long time ago, obviously, and I had never run for anything in my life. But um, becoming a county commissioner, and I served as a county commissioner for a total of twenty years. You know, it's about being able to make a difference in people's lives. It's about improving your community, improving for me, anyways. It's about how do I improve my community, improve my county, and my state now. Um, again, I'm fourth generation. I have grandchildren. They're sixth generation. So yeah, I care about what this state's gonna be. 
but really it's, it just comes down to everything I've worked on or tried to engage in. It's trying to make it better for everyone and just making that difference. So that's what motivates me. Great, well, thank you so much. Those are great stories. Uh, so we're gonna turn to our topic of Prop HH. And I, I just, I thought it would be, uh, a lot of you voted on this. You probably read the blue books uh, and um, done your research, but uh, just some, some background agreement on facts, I guess. Um, uh, I, I looked these up recently, so I think they're pretty much right. Um, the, so Colorado is a, is a wealthy state. We are in the top 10 of the 50 states for per capita income. We are a low spending state. We're in the bottom 10 states for state level spending. And we do a little better or a little higher spending, I guess, on the local level. So if you combine state and local, we're a, we're a bottom 20 state in, in spending. Um, and for property taxes, since that's a critical part of Prop HH, we're a bottom five state. We have very low property taxes. Uh, in fact, I used to joke when I moved here from the East Coast that they left a zero off the end of my property taxes. But more accurately, it's probably they left a one off the beginning of my property taxes relative to what people pay uh, on the East Coast. Um, so, uh, you know, we're pretty frugal with tax dollars. And part of that is Tabor. Part of that is probably cultural and other kinds of reasons. Uh, and Tabor was passed in 1992, more than 30 years ago, to, uh, to uh, limit state spending. We'll get into some of the details of that. Uh, and when uh, another part of Prop HH is when there's a Tabor surplus, when more money has been collected than the state is allowed to keep based on the growth of uh, population and inflation, it has to be given back to the taxpayers, right? And so that's part of what Prop HH uh, is going to talk about. Um, in the spring, the Colorado legislature referred Prop HH to the voters, and so we're, we're voting on it this week, uh, and it will allow, it's very complicated, I, we're getting into that, uh, I think, and it will be complicated for every individual in terms of how it, whether it, you know, is a net plus or a minus for them specifically, but it basically allows the state to keep some of the Tabor surplus and, and reducing the likely increase or the, the definite increase that's coming in property taxes. Um, so hopefully that's a fair uh, laying out of the land. And I wanna start with a, the first question is, um, why, why are property taxes going up so much? What, what is the issue there and, um, uh, and why, why is that a problem? And maybe start with Barb. Sure, thank you. So um, there are three factors that affect your property taxes. The first one is the value of the property. And then you times that by the assessment rate. And then it gets times by the mill levy. So the value of your property is determined by the market, and there's constitutional provisions with regard to that. The assessment rate is set by the legislature. We can't increase it without going to a vote, but we certainly can decrease it without going to a vote. And then the mill levy is at your local government taxing entities. So <clears throat> there was a constitutional amendment that was passed back in the 80s, I think 1982 or somewhere in that area. It was called the Gallagher Amendment. And it was a provision, and I'm gonna narrow this down pretty quickly to what, what I call it. The Gallagher Amendment essentially was a safety net for residential property taxes. It ratcheted down residential property taxes every year so that residential property taxes were only 45% uh, of the overall state aggregate property taxes paid throughout the state. Now, I want you to keep in mind, the state does not operate off of property taxes. We operate off of income tax and sales tax. It's your local government taxing entities who operate off of property taxes. So anyways, we had this amendment in place and it was working fine. Back in the old days, before the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, before Tabor, you could, as a local government, while the state was ratcheting down the assessment rate, while Gallagher was ratcheting down that assessment rate, like it dropped from basically around, I don't know, it was like, when I first became a county commissioner, it was around 28 you know, percent, the assessment rate was. And in 2020, it was 7.1. So it was ratcheting it down. But as a local government, to balance out, to determine what kind of revenues that you need it to operate in your um, local government taxing entity and working with your constituents on the amount of services they wish to provide, you could balance out the drop in the assessment rate by increasing your mill levy. But then in 1992, along comes the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, another constitutional amendment that essentially says you can't just increase your mill levy, local governments, unless you go to a vote of the people. 
It had a revenue limitation in it, taxpayer bill of rights did, an expenditure limitation and a mill levy limitation. So now when the, you know, the uh, assessment rate is going down, because remember it is value of property, assessment rate, mill levy. So when the assessment rate dropped and tax revenue started dropping, after Tabor passed, local governments could no longer just unilaterally increase their mill levies. They would have to go to a vote. So that all ends up getting worked out and balanced out to some degree over the years. Then lo and behold, in 2020, and it was a bipartisan legislature who referred to the ballot to essentially repeal the Gallagher Amendment, to take that out of our constitution, that safety net out of our constitution. And in fact, back then, uh, Governor Polis and legislators who were all in support of repealing the Gallagher Amendment said, we gotta do this, because if you don't, your property taxes are gonna increase. Now I'm thinking either they were misinformed and didn't understand how property tax worked back then in, you know, in 2020, or they were intentionally misleading people because it's pretty clear that property taxes were gonna go up. But in 2020, the majority of the people in the state voted to repeal the Gallagher Amendment. So it took away the safety net for residential property taxes. So instead of that rate assessment dropping it stayed the same. So in 2022, when values go through the roof, values go up, rate assessments here, mill levy stays here, your property taxes go through the roof. So repealing Gallagher is part of the reason why we're in this mess that we are. We were promised in 2020 that we'd come back with a fix for Gallagher, we did not. We all were told in 2020 that our property taxes, if you didn't vote for repealing the Gallagher Amendment, your property taxes would go up. Well, it got repealed and your property taxes went up. So the reason we're in the mess we're in is partially because we repealed Gallagher and got rid of our safety net and the assessment rate doesn't keep dropping and because the values increased so substantially over the course of the last two years. That's why we're in this mess. Great, thank you for trying to simplify a complicated situation. Uh, Jesse, other takes on that? I, I mean, I think that's all right. I mean, the, the important thing to keep in mind with the Gallagher Amendment and, and part of the reason behind the repeal was that it worked really well for homeowners, um, but, the, but the property tax burden fell to businesses who pay a four times higher assessment rate. And then for some parts of the state, it went okay, but if your values didn't go up and you were in a place like rural Colorado and you were a fire district, um, you know, those folks were oftentimes complaining that they didn't have enough money. So that was a lot of the thinking behind repealing the Gallagher Amendment. The legislature and the people behind that did say, and the governor, right, we will come up with a replacement. And then year after year at the legislature, we started to see these kind of piecemeal property tax, like two-year relief bills on the assessment rate, because that's the only thing that the legislature can control, and some of, of decreasing value or taking some of the value out of, out of the equation. Um, but it ended up being, you know, uh, a yearly battle and there was like an arms race. And one time I was in the bottom of the cap, the basement of the Capitol and they were like signing an armistice to like everyone laid down their arms. Like I described it as like an arms, an arms race literally because it kind of was that. Um, Cause conservative groups have ideas and, and progressive or liberal groups have other ones. And so oftentimes those um, come into conflict and everything would get worked out in the last couple of weeks of the session. Then, then comes along the pandemic and everybody's housing, house prices go up 40%. And as Senator Kirkmeyer mentioned, right? There's those three, calculations that, that lead to property taxes. So if your home value goes up by 40%, you know, your, your property taxes are going to shoot up as well. And so then the legislature was kind of forced with this, oh my God, you know, the, the plans that we made, we all knew that everyone's property values were going to go up, but we didn't realize they're going to go up by 40%. Along comes Proposition HH. Um, and, and that's the, the effort to uh, limit the increase on the decrease, which I know is complicated, but there's no way to easily kind of explain this stuff. And, and that's part of the reason why Gallagher hasn't been replaced is because property taxes are very complicated. If you pull on one string, right, you affect something else. And, and the way the Colorado system it works out is that, you know, the assessment rates that are changed on the statewide level affect different communities in different ways because the property values that go up in Denver don't go up in the same way in Lamar, right? In Aspen, um, you know, property values went up 100%. In Douglas County, they went up 40%. In Denver, it was like 33%, right? So, um, you know, each val each community has its own needs and, and things get really complicated. So that's that's part of the background for why we don't have a, a Gallagher replacement. But also, you know, 
you can't get everyone on the same page. You know, different Democrats in the legislature, Democrats control the Capitol, um, you know, have different ideas about how they want to do this. And if there was an easy solution or one that everyone could come to the agreement to, I think it, it, would, it would have been done. So. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Carrie, your thoughts on the Properties Act? Yeah, they summarized it well. Um, Senator Kirkmeyer said multiple times that over the last 30 years, we've seen the assessment rate on residential properties ratcheted down, ratcheted down, ratcheted down. And it was a statewide constitutional formula. And what was driving that ratcheting down was growth in property values in the front range and in resort areas. But for the rest of the state that didn't have that kind of growth, they lived with that ratcheting down. They didn't have the growth to offset it. So you saw small rural districts, water districts, fire districts, library districts, closing their doors, cutting back services because they literally couldn't, keep, couldn't afford to keep their doors open. So the Gallagher Amendment formula was causing great distortions and huge challenges across the state. And as Jesse pointed out, it also shifted the burden to businesses over the decades. And if that formula remained in the Constitution long term, eventually it would have taken the uh, property tax burden almost exclusively onto our businesses. So imagine trying to fund your public education system just on the backs of your local businesses. Didn't make any sense. That's why the Gallagher Amendment repeal was referred to the voters with a strong bipartisan majority out of the General Assembly. That was Republicans and Democrats coming together saying, this policy doesn't make any sense anymore. And it was pulled out of the Constitution. When Gallagher was repealed, the governor said, I thought he, I thought he was very clever. He said, there's two things about replacing the Gallagher Amendment. One, we don't wanna replace it with something worse than the Gallagher Amendment. And two, we don't want another formula in the Constitution because we've all seen the long-term consequences of not being able to let the state adjust as our economy grows and changes and these formulas create these distortions. So the conversation began in earnest, Senator Kirkmeyer's accurate about the replacement to the Gallagher Amendment. And Prop HH provides immediate relief uh, reductions for all properties so that they don't have to see their bills go up this year with their values going up. This becomes a policy choice now rather than a constitutional formula. And this is a responsible policy choice. Prop HH also includes a permanent long-term cap on the growth of property taxes at the district level statewide to protect property owners from future growth in their property taxes as their values go up. But it's a responsible cap that preserves local control. So it becomes a replacement to the Gallagher Amendment that puts in protections for property owners, but does so in a way that doesn't create the, the real negative impacts that we were seeing from uh, the constitutional formula. Great, thank you. Um, great start to a complicated topic. I think some agreeable disagreement on Gallagher and uh, what it did or didn't do, uh, pro or con, um, but it's gone now and, and we, um, we are working on the consequences of that. Um, the second piece then to Prop HH is, I mean, I should say on, on property taxes, right? I mentioned earlier, we're a bottom five state on property taxes, but nobody likes the property taxes to go up, right? And, and the, the uh, citizen tax revolts in the early 1980s, uh, Prop 13 in California, Prop two and a half in Massachusetts and others were a result of property taxes going up, right? So e even though we start from a low level, you know, a 20, 30, 40% increase in your taxes is, is gonna annoy people, right? Um, and it's gonna affect also homeowners and renters somewhat differently. And people, as Jesse mentioned, in different parts of the state, uh, depending on how values were, were going. But the, the flip side of Prop HH is to use Tabor uh, surplus to uh, help blunt the property tax increases and allow the state to keep more of the money that's been collected. And so I want to, uh, starting with Carrie, ask a question about that. Um, why, why do we have Tabor surpluses? Uh, is this a good use of them? And does uh, Prop HH leave any Tabor surplus left uh, after dealing with the property tax increase issue? Carrie? Yeah, so Prop HH recognizes that when we avoid folks uh, property taxes from these big increases, and we do these across the board cuts, that it's gonna 
take away, it's going to reduce revenue for all of your local service districts. They are not going to benefit from the growth that you're seeing in your values statewide uh, unless we backfill them. And so Prop HH recognizes that we have very large state surpluses right now, $3.7 billion. Um, last year, folks got $750 back uh, in their Tabor refund. If Prop HH passes, folks are gonna get $833 back, uh, even with HH on the books uh, next year. And the year after that, Prop HH captures a portion of that surplus, which will continue to grow as long as state revenues continue to grow. But Prop HH captures a small portion of it and sends it to your fire districts, your library districts, your school districts, your water districts to replace some of the property tax revenue that they are not going to collect when we lower these rates statewide. Um, and that to me makes Prop HH a responsible package, unlike what we were seeing with the Gallagher Amendment where you saw these fire districts um, having to curtail their services. This recognizes that those fire districts have been um, limited in their resources for years. They're facing increasing pressure uh, in terms of services. And we need to be responsible about making sure that they can meet community needs. Same thing with K-12 education. We, uh, ha over half the school districts in the state today have average teacher salaries below $45,000 a year. I was thrilled to death to be a part of the Polis administration and the budget that was announced yesterday that we are finally eliminating the budget stabilization factor that has underfunded schools for decades below what voters approved back in 2000, an amendment that I worked on. Uh, but we want to make sure we have a tax base that is responsible and stable so that our schools and our local districts can continue to meet the needs in their communities and pass property tax relief so that folks don't see this huge $1,000, $2,000 increase in their bill this year. Thank you. Uh, Jesse? All right, this is the part where I'm, I'm a little scared to be sitting between these two for, for, for the Tabor surplus argument. I will say we have a really interesting story uh, this morning in our newsletter that's going to come out next week, kind of looking at why the state's able to pay off the BS factor. A lot of it has to do with the rising property taxes. Legislature and the governor are probably going to take credit for it. But in reality, property taxes have a lot to do with, with the, uh, the fact that the BS factor is, is going to go away. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it, probably everyone in this room has an idea about how Tabor works, right? I mean, it caps government growth and, and spending each year to the rate of inflation plus population, and then Prop HH would add a percentage point on top of that. So in the first year of HH, it would be pretty small. It's like 170 million, but by the 10th year, it could be billions of dollars, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it compounds year over year as you grow the Tabor cap. Um, and I think one of the things that's, that's important to recognize is that, you know, a lot of people on both sides talk about how great it is that we have taper surplus and, and what to do with it, should it go back to voters? And part of the reason that the surplus exists right now and that it's so large is the way that um, that inflation plus population taper cap is, is calculated. So the, the inflation rate used to calculate the taper cap every year is six months old by the time it goes into effect for the budget year. So in 2022, I'm gonna hopefully get my numbers right, but when the 22-23 budget went into effect, the taper cap was calculated using like a 3.5% inflation rate. But by that point, we already at 8% 8, 8 inflation. So the government starts collecting, you know, all kinds of more money, but we have this cap at 3.5%. So as you can see, we're starting to get into this compounded year over year situation where, you know, the taper cap is being exceeded by historic amounts. So, you know, taper surplus isn't a guarantee in any given year. Um, I think that's that's something that's important to keep in mind. It, it happens when the economy is doing well and when you get these kind of economic conditions that um, you know don't line up in terms of inflation. There's been pushes from the JVCs. Um, actually, Senator Kirk Meyer's predecessor, Bob Rankin, you know, wanted to to take inflation out of it or or make the inflation rate used to calculate the cap more consistent with the actual economic conditions to to um, you know kind of align things a little better. But you know. I think that's kind of off the table for now, especially since now everyone wants to use the Tabor surplus for, for whatever their um, project is. But I think something to keep in mind about Prop HH is, is it's really important to understand how the backfill mechanisms work, because that's kind of where um, the details of this uh, are, are 
th this is where this this thing really functions in in, a, in an interesting way. Um, you know, schools get a hundred percent of the money that they lose under the the property tax decreases, and then they get more money than that too. So there's mo even more money set aside for schools in future years. Um, you know, Ms. Kennedy says it's, it's for uh, years where there might be an economic downturn where that surplus doesn't exist so that there's always money for schools so they don't ever lose out. You know, opponents of that will say, look, you know, you're just kind of, you're funding schools above and beyond what they need to be. Um, you know, you're just increasing school funding. And then local districts um, are capped to 20% of that 1%, it's called the Prop HH cap, that one percentage point increase. They only get 20% of, of that uh, extra money that the legislature is allowed to keep. So 170 million, you guys can do the math. It's not a ton of money. Um, and over time, local districts do lose out on a pretty significant amount of money over time that, that they would have collected under HH. So I'm not going to get into the Tabor refund stuff because I think Senator Kirk Meyer is going to, but that is where your Tabor refund dollars do come from, that surplus. So as you eliminate the surplus over time, um, with that one percentage point increase, your Tabor refunds go down. And, and opponents would say, look, we're using that to, to back for the local go governments to offset for the property tax decrease that you're um, facing. But, you know, keep in mind, right, that, that not everybody uh, owns a house in Denver uh, or in Colorado. Again, proponents of that would say, look, you know, the property tax savings are being passed on to, to renters. You know, I think it depends on if your landlord is a nice person or not. Um, but, you know, it, it's again, this is all really complicated. And any of these calculations can change if there's, you know, say a, a global conflict, right? And the economy tanks or, or COVID happens and the economy tanks. You might not have taper surplus in a given year. And, you know, even if that one percentage point increase over time, you know, proponents like to say it's going to eliminate your taper refunds forever. We have said that's misleading and not true. Really what, what it comes down to is, you know, it increases the chances over time in a given year that you will not have taper refunds. As that HH crap, as, as that HH cap grows, um, it, it increases the chances that there won't be taper surplus in a given year. But ultimately, like no one has a crystal ball and I can't say what's going to happen in 10 years. You know, the state could, you know, quadruple in population and inflation could outpace population. Taper might go away. You know, it's really hard to it's really hard to make those those um, kind of estimates for, you know, nine, 10 years down the road. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what Senator Kirkmeyer has to say, because. I know she has thoughts on this. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Jesse. As, as I said, very complicated. And so I appreciate you all working through this. Barb? It is complicated, but it's not that complicated. You know, only in government, only in government do politicians tell you that you're going to get meaningful property tax relief when they know that your property taxes are still going up. They're not going to be less than they were last year. They're going to increase 30% or more. Only in government do we say, God, that's meaningful relief. I'm going to give you a slight decrease in your increase, but you're getting meaningful relief. I hope you were listening to what my friends to the right of me said. Tabor allows for inflation plus population growth, allows government to grow by inflation plus population growth. So I don't know, I don't know about all of you, but I did not get anywhere from a 10 to 11% increase in my net income in the last year. Did you? You know, we talk about needs of government. Did we forget about the taxpayer? Did we forget about the property owner here who's dealing with that 8.2% increase in inflation? And now they're dealing with 30% increase in their property taxes? Did we forget about the property tax burden that we are placing at every level of government on our citizens? I mean, we keep talking about the fire district's needs. You know what I say from a former local government official, 20 years as a county commissioner, did you go talk to your citizens? Part of the problem with elected officials is they think this is the level of services I wanna provide that I think my citizens need. But this is the level of revenues that I have. So I'm gonna go out there and try and increase the revenues to the level of services that I think you all want. Local governments and the state have the ability to, it's called float. You can float the mill levy. You can float it down. And then you can increase it back up in a, in a bad year, working with your constituents. You know, I don't know, actually going out and talking to folks. The 
state legislature, we can float the assessment rate down. And in fact, we did. We lowered it. Did we come and ask you for a vote on that? No, because we can decrease your taxes. We don't have to ask you to do that. But Proposition HH, we've got to ask you if we're going to actually increase your taxes. <clears throat> so your property taxes, they're going up. They're not going to be less than, than last year. They're going to increase because of the values. Tabor surplus. Yep, we've got it. Um, a lot of people in state government think that that's state government money. It's not an expend expenditure. It's a refund. We passed a constitutional amendment in 1992 that said, you know what, state, when you go over, you don't need more than inflation plus growth. You have to tighten your belt just like I do around my kitchen table when I'm trying to figure out how to pay my bills. So does state government. That's why we're in such good shape. But what does Proposition HH say? It says that state government, not local governments, where we're trying to deal with a property tax issue, all of a sudden here we are, the state saying, whoa, we need more money now. We're gonna grow government. And we're gonna do that by increasing the cap, by increasing that level, that limit, that once we go over it, we've got to refund you back your hard earned tax dollars. Those are your dollars. Those aren't our dollars. And HH says, we're gonna add 1% to it. So state government gets to grow by this next year, 8.2% plus growth, one or 2%. And if HH were to pass, 1%. That's outrageous. That is outrageous that we don't consider what this tax burden is doing to our citizens. That we think we've got to increase our budget by, I mean, last year we increased it by almost 8%, our budget for the state of Colorado. Do y'all increase your budgets by 8%? I'll bet your expenditures because of inflation increased about that much or more. And here we are saying, gosh, you're not gonna get real property tax relief because your property taxes are still going up. And on the flip side of that, we wanna grow state government by at least $10 billion over the next 10 years by getting your Tabor refunds. Now, are your Tabor refunds gonna go away in the first year? No, but over the course of time, and there's a bunch of finance people in here, 1% compounded annually. You know what Legislative Council, our nonpartisan staff says? Over 10 years, that's $10 billion of what should have been coming back to your pocket, your money back to you, it's coming into state coffers. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that we aren't truly looking out for the people that we serve. And as far as education funding goes, I was actually just really astonished Last year in the governor's budget, he came in with 10 cents on the dollar to fund education. We had a constitutional amendment passed. Ms. Kennedy was involved in that. Great idea. Boil it down, required that education funding was supposed to increase by 1%. Now my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, under Democrat leadership, the governor's office for the last 14 years haven't followed the will of the voters. They haven't followed the constitution. For the last 14 years, they've been balancing the state budget on the backs of education. They have been shortchanging students and education for the last 14 years. Last year, the number was $321 million. The governor came in in his budget proposal, and I sit on the Joint Budget Committee if I didn't mention that. Governor came in in his budget proposal to buy down that, that's what it's called, buying it down, that $321 million by $35 million. And he said in his budget proposal last year, we'll, we'll, we'll fully fund education and within the next three years, but we're not gonna do it this year. So you know what happened in the last legislative session? It wasn't the governor who's out there taking credit for buying this down and fully funding education. 
I had to fight tooth and nail with my Republican colleagues, first of all, to buy down that 321 by $180 million. And we had a provision put in the law in the School Finance Act that says no more budget stabilization factor which is a negative factor that goes in after the fact, takes a percentage off and says, this is how much we're gonna shortchange students in education. It's called the BS factor. Now, you knew I owned a dairy farm. When I heard the BS factor, I thought, hmm, I, th I know what BS is. And it's appropriately named because it's BS that we haven't been fully funding education for the last 14 years. But we put a provision in law last year in the School Finance Act that said that budget stabilization factor is repealed effective July 1, 2024. So, you know, the governor wants to take credit for it, seriously? Again, why are we being so misleading? Why are we being so disingenuous? The reality with Proposition HH is you do lose your Tabor refund eventually and in perpetuity because what the proponents of HH don't wanna tell you, and they don't ever, I've been to enough of these throughout the last four months, never heard them mention it, but there's a provision in HH that says no more voter approval required. If you vote for this and you give up your Tabor refunds this year, that's it. We don't ever have to come back to you and ask for it as a legislature ever. There's a provision that allows for that. So Barbara, thank you. That there's a lot to unpack here. And I, I, I understand the nature of the disagreement, I think. And uh, I, I do think there's some interesting common ground about the state funding education as fully as they can, which is also uh, close to our hearts in, in higher ed, where we're, you know, 47th or 48th in the, in the country in funding. I have to throw that in. That yeah, we should. Um, but I want to, I want to move to maybe the politics of it and, and what comes next, um, if we can a little bit. So a, a very quick question first, uh, do you think this will pass? And what are the politics of this look like? What do we know? Are there polling numbers anybody's seeing? Or maybe start with Barb. Well, let's start with Jenny. Yeah. Well, so the last polling that I saw was done right before uh, the messaging began. So it was kind of in early October and, and Prop HH was not in great shape. I think it was up by maybe like it was like 51 percent. Um, and that was before the messaging started. So I think like this thing is going to be won or lost on the millions of dollars that are being spent on both sides to, to influence people's votes. Um, the fact that, well... My sense is that it's it's on shaky ground, right? And so I think if it passes, it passes by a narrow margin. If it fails, you know, it, it, I think either way, it'll be within two or three percentage points. Um, and I think I don't think anyone would disagree with me on either side about that. But um, you know, th th this is it's um, Colorado voters because of Tabor are asked to make really complex, and and in part because of the legislature, right? And I, I'm not I'm not going to make statements. Of, <laughs> this is this is where things get complicated. Because of Tabor, right, I mean, Colorado voters are asked to make complex tax decisions, you know, that, that legislatures decide on their own. And we know, historically speaking, that when voters look at a ballot and um, they don't understand what's on it, they typically vote no. Now, the legislature wrote this in a way that, that the ballot language that makes it seem not complicated, but as you can tell, right, I mean, I've probably touched like 5% of Prop HH in, the, in what I've talked about. Um, it's immensely complicated. And I think if people read into it, you know, voters voters get educated and they can't understand it, I think they're gonna vote against it. And so I think that's a challenge for the ballot measure. I think that there's been a lot of money spent against it. There's been compelling, you know, TV ads and, and mailers um, sent out. There's there's more money coming now onto the pro side that are running, that are have TV, TV ads and mailers. It's, it's 2023, it's an off year election. I don't know what turnout's gonna look like. Um, I don't know, did anyone get a phone call from the Secretary of State last night telling you to turn in your ballot, right? So, so um, you know, my sense, if, if I was a betting man, I would, I would feel better if I was um, Senator Kirkmeyer than if I was Kerry Kenton right now, I will say, say that. Kerry, is that, is that where things stand in your view? I'm, I'm pretty happy over here. So that poll that uh, Jesse just referenced had 51% yes, 25% no. Rest one decided two to one support over not support. And I think 
the people of Colorado don't want to see their tax bill spike when they get it in the mail next month. Um, they understand that incomes don't go up as fast as their values of their homes have gone up. And Prop HH guarantees over a billion dollars of property tax relief a year, every year for the next decade. So folks are not going to see uh, their tax bills go up as their values go up. And I think the people of Colorado want to do that in a responsible way where they don't cut funding from their schools and their fire districts. I think they're supportive of the investments that are being made in their communities. They don't want to see those services cut. So, so I think we win. Can I say one thing? Sure, one thing. So what my caution is, is anytime anyone makes a, a number argument about Prop HH that is more than one fiscal year out, I just would take it with a huge grain of salt, okay? Not to disparage anybody, but in reality, right, the only thing that we can say is, yeah, you're, you're um, we can say with 100% certainty is that you're going to get a $832 flat rate refund, no matter who you are, if it passes. The uh, cap is going to, Prop HH crap cap is going to grow by like 170 million because that one percentage point increase. And then everything else is kind of up to political and economic situations. So all other estimates, I mean, okay, what do you, you want to say? Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to jump in and, and say, I, I respect that. However, property tax relief, those rates are going to be down. It is guaranteed. Whether your home value goes up or goes down, that rate's coming down. You're saving that money. You are saving that money every year. <laughs> for the decade. Surpluses, surp, the rates will be lower every year for the decade. Surpluses, the, tabor, the impact year Tabor surplus, those numbers really look different depending on what happens with the economy. So it is very hard to predict where that goes in. Uh, Senator Kirkmeyer will give you the largest numbers of the impacts. The Colorado Fiscal Institute did an analysis that showed if state revenues grow 5% a year over that decade, that families will still get $10,000 back in Tabor rebates because the economy's grown. And even though we've raised that cap by 1%, you still have a lot of revenue coming in over that cap that's growing over the decade. People are gonna get a lot of Tabor rebates back. So that's a lot of property tax relief and a lot of table rebates if you see growth in the economy over the decade. So I just, again, I just want to point out to you, does government really need to grow by that much? And shouldn't we have a say in it? Because apparently we forgot there's this provision in HH where we don't have to come back. You vote this year to do away with Tabor refunds to the tune of $10 billion over the next 10 years. We don't have to come back to you to ask for that again. And we didn't have to come to you in the first place to ask you to decrease your property taxes. So your property taxes are going up. And do you remember how I started off? Value times the rate times the mill levy. To increase the mill levy, local governments have to go to their voters and ask to increase mill levies. They don't have to go to decrease them though. The assessment rate, let's just say it stays the same as it's uh, purported to be in Proposition HH at 6.7 on residential property, great. But in that next reappraisal year, because apparently everyone's forgotten and down at the, on the first floor, I'm on the second floor in the Capitol, but on the first floor, apparently everybody either doesn't know or they don't wanna tell you or they've forgotten. Every other year, your property is reappraised. Assessors go out. We knew about this problem last year but assessors go out every other year and reappraise all the property. So if your values go up and the assessment rate stays the same and the mill levy stays the same, your property taxes are going up. They are going up. This whole notion that, oh my God, we're gonna save all the special districts because we're gonna backfill them, the numbers are in. Of the 5,600 approximately local government taxing entities, 1,034 will get any kind of reimbursement. 300 approximately of them, less than 300 actually, I'm just rounding off here, will get 100% reimbursement. Yes, those are out in the more rural parts of our state. About 300 of them will get a 90% reimbursement and the other 400 approximately will get a 65% reimbursement. But again, think about how much your government is growing. 
Are your incomes growing that much? What are your expenditures doing? When are we gonna take care of our citizens? So Thank proposition you. HH, not a good deal. And with regard to the polling, the latest polling shows that it's going down. Okay, good. There you go. Thanks, thanks for the uh, input on that. Uh, again, lots of lots of complicated numbers and changes here that are uh, no doubt one of the reasons we're here discussing it. Um, if, if you have questions on the three by five cards, I think Dee Dee's picking those up and uh, I'll be asking a couple of those in a minute. Um, the um, another question I have is is so if this if this doesn't pass, right? What what happens next? And and I you know not necessarily next month. You know people open their property taxes and they're higher, which sounds like it's going to be the case. But um, I, I hear on the you know right of center side, there's a discussion about a hard cap on property tax percentage around the state that might come forward in the next year or two. Um, obviously, the legislature could do something different this spring if uh, if Prop HH doesn't pass. I, I also hear on the left of center, there are uh, groups that are planning uh, perhaps a broader uh, look at Tabor and, and bringing other things in the next couple of years to in the fiscal situation. But what, if this fails, where, where are we? Um, and what how do we deal with some of these property tax issues in particular? I'll start with Barb. Can I, can I add another sure. part to that very long question? Because I think, yeah, yeah, so, so, and what do you guys, what do <laughs> well, I want to ask this, but what, and what do you do, I think, sure. on both sides, right? What do you do about the budget stabilization factor, knowing that, you know, Prop HH was created in a way that, that helps eliminate it if property taxes go down, if the legislature lowers, lowers them, that increases the state share. Can you still eliminate the BS factor if you lower property taxes, if Prop HH doesn't pass? So to, to answer the question, if Proposition HH doesn't pass, can we still eliminate the budget stabilization factor? Well, you heard the governor a couple of days ago. He presented his budget. And it's not based on HH or II, what happens there? Because I asked that question too. And there we go. We're eliminating, we're fully funding education and we're eliminating the budget stabilization factor. Can you, can you My, property taxes though? Can you still, like if, if HH fails, can you lower property taxes as a legislature and eliminate the BS factor? Yes. Yes, we can. Because again, remember, we operate off of income tax and sales tax. Local governments, I mean, the school districts work off of property taxes. And apparently, again, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle apparently forgot. In 2021, a law was passed. We took away a property tax credit or a credit that we were giving to school districts. And don't ask me to explain it. I wasn't here when we did it. I was just here when we took it away. And the result was, and a requirement was across the state, that certain school districts across the state had to increase their mill levies by one mill each year until they got up to 27 mills or they fully were able to pay their property tax credit. So we increased property taxes right there for school districts. What the result of that was in this last year budget is that the state decreased their share of what they need to pay for public schools and for education by $158 million. And we increased the local government share by about 640 million. So all these games that they keep playing down there, that's the result. You know, they keep talking about property tax relief when in fact, they've increased your property taxes substantially. And that still comes into play. So in the state budget, the balance as of the last budget year, we had 1.2 billion approximately in the state education fund, which is funded 1% off, off of sales tax. Is it sales tax or income tax? God, I just lost it. Thank you. Income, thank you. 1% off of income tax, right? Goes into the state education fund. Plus school districts are now paying it, they pay into it. I mean, what we were trying to do apparently in 21 was, is balance out because school districts were paying as much as the state was, even though our constitution says we're required to fund a free public school system throughout the state. But we have 1.2 billion in the state education fund. We've got about 1.2 billion in the permanent trust fund, which again, those are to be used for education, these dollars. And then we have about 2.2 billion in unrestricted reserves. So if we have to figure out how to, oh, I don't know, prioritize our budget, we have the funds to be able to do that and fund education. But for the last 14 years, they haven't prioritized education. Maybe this year now, we're gonna get down to it, follow the constitution, not figure out a little loophole as one state representative called it and actually fully fund education. It's a prioritization issue. It's not a revenue issue. 
Thank, thanks, Barb. Um, Carrie, uh, if it doesn't pass, what do you see happening next? Yeah, it's an important question. And it's important to know the context within which HH was referred to the ballot. The extreme anti-tax organizations in this state have for the last couple of years been titling measures to go to the ballot, to go to voters that would put constitutional formulas back into our state constitution that would completely cut off the ability of all of our local governments to capture the growth in property taxes over time. If folks are familiar with California and Proposition 13, it decimated funding for public education and higher education in that state over the last 40 years. And proposals that look almost identical to it, constitutional amendments have been titled here in Colorado each of the last, I don't know, two or three years. We've been able to successfully build a coalition behind Proposition HH, which doesn't go down the road of adding another constitutional formula and which brings a coalition together to make sure that we don't decimate uh, with yet another formula in the constitution funding for local services in Colorado. But those groups are moving forward for 2024. They have already titled constitutional amendments that would cap the growth in property taxes in Colorado. And you're seeing now uh, some of the progressive organizations responding and filing measures that would do things like put uh, uh, higher taxes on homes valued at over $2 million to try to raise the money to backfill. And you also have a lot of local government groups that would like to see a constitutional amendment saying property taxes need to be only under the control of local governments. Enough of this state conversation, as Senator Kirkmeyer pointed out, uh, the state sets the assessment rate on properties. A lot of local governments would like a constitutional amendment that says, nope, hey, property taxes are a local tax and we control at the local level uh, the property tax collections. So this conversation is going to continue. We'll all be back here uh, having this conversation about measures that get titled in the future. I think if folks come together and Proposition HH passes, um, that you're going to see people feel like they have adequate protections against rising property taxes, and it will take the heat off this conversation. If HH fails, I think there's a real risk of some pretty draconian stuff coming forward in 2024 and future years. So if I could actually answer yeah. your question, I'm sorry, I answered Jesse's question. He got me sidetracked, as usual. But um, what happens next? Uh, so Republicans have been asking since they uh, introduced this bill in the last week of session, we've been asking for a special session on this and let's really get down to it and hammer out what we can do to relieve the tax burden on our call on Colorado, on all Colorado. So um, we had a press conference last week or so, and uh, we came out with our plan and it's not like, this is just where we think we should be starting. We want to make sure that we have those conversations because again, I, I'm just going to remind everyone in the room. Every local government organization, association, like Colorado counties, Colorado Municipal League, Special Districts Association, they're opposed to Proposition HH. Small businesses, they're opposed to Proposition HH. So we didn't do a really good job of stakeholdering Proposition HH or what was known as Senate Bill 303. In fact, I call them stakeholder meetings instead of stakeholder meetings because people just didn't feel like they were really in the room and they didn't, they, that's why they're all opposed to it. So we have a plan that says, look, let's start by looking at the senior property tax exemption, uh, the Homestead Act, right? And we've actually tried this for the last couple of years. Democrats keep voting it down. Portions of this are actually in Proposition HH. So there are some things in HH that we did like, and we tried to get passed. But again, I don't need to have your Tabor refund to get these things passed. So the, pro the portability of the senior property tax exemption is something we should address in a special session. Uh, Increasing the exemption, and we're suggesting we start at 200,000, increasing the exemption for seniors, 100% disabled veterans and gold star spouses, that we should do that as well. 
you know, if 200,000 isn't culpable to everybody, you know, at the legislature, then let's, let's have the discussion about it. Let's not try and shove stuff through. We also are suggesting that um, we work with our local government partners in coming up with a way to fix the property tax issue. What can we do as a legislature? What can they do as local governments? And we've actually had a couple of really very productive meetings just in the last week with them about how do we try and make this work for our constituents? It's not all about you, government. We've got to talk about our constituents. And then our third proposal is, again, this is where we're starting, is that as the governor has mentioned in his last five of the five state of, five of, five state of the state addresses, is that we should use the Turbert Tabor surplus instead of refunding it to you in a check or through your income tax, that we should actually just lower the income tax and not have a surplus in the first place, that we shouldn't be over collecting from our citizens in the first place. And we're suggesting that we start again, this is our starting point, that we lower it from 4.4% to 4%. Great. All of that is doable. Thank you. Um, I want to get to a couple of the audience questions as we're running short on time, but uh, the um, obviously this is complicated and pass or fail. It doesn't solve all of our problems. Um, it, to make it further complicated, as one of our audience members asked, there, there's a single subject rule in Colorado in terms of what we vote on. It. This uh, Prop HH was, uh, there was a challenge. I know I, uh, we're not all lawyers in the room and it, maybe it's ultimately a court case, but if it does pass, would there be a uh, single subject challenge against it? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Maybe start with Carrie. Oh. <laughs> okay. Do you mind if I start with that? Because I think, I mean, I, I, so this was challenged and, and I think this is important and I, they're probably going to say different things, but this was challenged before it, after it passed the legislature and the judge ruled that, you know, because of the separation of powers between the legislative branch and the judicial branch, that he couldn't make a ruling, but he also ruled that if I had to make a ruling on this, it wouldn't violate the single subject. That doesn't preclude a ruling in the, in the future, but I think that's just important context before anyone else answers. And, and just to be clear, the single subject rule says that something we vote on should be about a single subject. And it's come up in a lot in the context of Tabor because Tabor was passed before the single subject rule in, in the 90s and Tabor is many things. And so dismantling Tabor potentially might be many things. And Carrie and then Barb on this. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but, you know, the court uh, came back and said if he had to make a ruling, he would find it a single subject. It's because uh, schools and local governments are funded with property taxes. So uh, if you use uh, a portion of the Tabor surplus to backfill some of this property tax relief, as um, Henry Sobonet, who supports us, he's the governor's, uh, he's Governor Owen's former budget director, says the hip bones connected to the leg bone and you can't really talk about property taxes. Um, without talking about funding schools and other local services. And so we believe this is squarely within single subject. And that's interesting because, um, and I guess apparently I didn't understand from it, but whatever Jesse says, I'm gonna go with on what he said with regard to what the judge said. But um, Independent Institute basically took Proposition HH or Senate Bill 303 and submitted it as a bill title to the, you know, it goes into the Secretary of State's office. They have a title board and they actually, you know, when citizens want to initiate something to the ballot, they've got to go through the title board. When the legislature wants to just refer, they can just go however they want to and go refer stuff, right? And I can't tell you how many times I've heard down at the Capitol that, well, if we pass it, it's constitutional. <laughs> Crazy. They've lost on a few of these recently, but anyways, Citizens Initiative, Independence Institute put in a carbon copy of Proposition HH in as a title, and the title board refused to set a title, and they wouldn't put it on the ballot. So there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, He's got something to say well, on that. Jessica, I, I actually thought this was pretty clever of John Caldera, and I just want to say, if you want to, there, CBS4 did a story on this. I think it was actually pretty, I, I think that there was, it was a little bit more nuanced um, I think they did set a title, but it was it was kind of a complicated title. Maybe we'll, well, I'll defer to the CBS four story. I, I just if you want to know more about it, I thought I thought this was kind of and interesting I guess we'll question. see if if HH does pass and there's a challenge. Um, it'll the courts will make the decisions as as they often do. Um, we're we're up against time. This has been a fantastic discussion. Again, we don't get kicked out. There's more food and coffee. Hopefully, if you want to hang out and talk about the nuances of this or or uh, anything else. 
uh, on a nice Colorado day. Uh, I want to thank our uh, supporters today from Stiefel. Uh, we really appreciate their support. And, and please join me in giving a huge hand to our panel. I think we would like to thank you and the university for doing this. Um, this was this is great. I mean, it was a great discussion. I haven't been on too many panels with Jesse here to talk about it, but thank you for engaging and being here and wanting to know what's going on in your government. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>